Thanks for having us. Um, my name is Chris. This is Andrew. Hey, everyone. And uh, before we get into the introductions, I just want to ask, like, who? Raise your hand if you like music. Raise your hand if you like music. Okay, that's it. Thanks. This is a good, good crowd. Thanks a lot, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Well, um, as I mentioned, I'm Chris, and uh, you know, as per the introduction, I'm one of the founders of a local company called Neo Financial, and uh, my role there is head of engineering. I work with a lot of software developers. And hey, everyone. I'm Andrew. I'm one of our directors of data and analytics at Neo. Uh, I've been with Neo for about two years, um, and previously I worked in power generation. And the uh, the title of our talk, in case you missed it. Uh, Business in the front, party in the back. That's, that's, get the wings? That's, that's what the wings are about? Uh, this is not my natural hair. Uh, so the idea is, you know, we're gonna talk a bit about flexible data for software development teams, but also structured data for business analytics teams. And uh, also, you know, we wanna tell you a bit about Neo. Um, I was gonna ask, you know, who knows about Neo? Like, you had to watch that commercial, like, five times probably today. Um, but uh, who knows about Neo? Yeah, yeah, most people know. So um, our, our goal at Neo is to you know, build a better bank. We want to disrupt the you know, financial services ecosystem. We want to have better financial services for all Canadians. We've been at it for about three and a half, almost four years now, and uh, we're still just getting started at Neo. There's still a lot more to do and a lot more to build. Yeah, and I think we kind of we're sitting together trying to figure out a good format for this talk, and we thought we'd start by just describing the data we have, because um, not everyone will know what kind of data we use at NEO. Um, so for those of you who know, NEO is a financial services company, we're a fintech, uh, and we have all kinds of data, all kinds of places, uh, but most importantly, we have our customer data. We have a microservice backend that Chris will get into uh, that contains a ton of information about our customers, their transactions, their accounts. Um, we also have financial data in the form of ledger databases that store kind of immutable um, records of your transactions within the company. Um, we have risk and fraud data sets, um, which are really cool, uh, really high speed, high frequency data sets that we receive kind of in real time. Uh, and we have rewards data sets, uh, lots of data that comes through our rewards network. Has anyone ever used the app to get a reward at a Sandra? Yes. Who has Neo? Raise your hand if you have Neo. Oh, come on. Okay, well your goal is to sign up on your phone before the end of this talk. Just a not so subtle plug there. Um, but we have rewards data as well from folks who engage with the rewards network and with our merchant partners. Um, but those are just a few of the data sets we have. We have you know, mass volumes and it continues to grow every day, every week. I'm buried in data all the time. How do we use it? Um, you can see some of the bullets here. I mean, we use data in everything we do at NEO, uh, and it is what we think um, makes NEO one of, it's a big differentiator for NEO, is that access to the data and our ability to make use of it in terms of our product development and the services we offer to our customers. Internally, we have uh, you know, a lot of business teams who use our, our data for insights, uh, for dashboarding, which everyone loves. Um, we also use it for integrations, and we'll get into the reason why a little bit later in this presentation. Um, for decisioning, for real-time decisioning on things like fraud or, or lending decisions, um, for advanced analytics, and for reporting. A lot of our reporting goes through our data platform. Uh, that's very fun. Maybe one more thing I'll add about Neo before we move on is that you know, um, you know, we're more than just an app. Actually, you know, if you if you have your money with Neo, we store uh, that money at Neo. We we are the source of record for people's finances. We're the, uh, when we do rewards, we're the ones deciding to give people rewards. If we lend money, if we give someone like a mortgage, or if we give someone a credit card, we get, we get to decide how much money to lend them. So um, all this data is extremely, extremely important because all those decisions happen um, in House of Neo. Okay, so I'm gonna take over for a few minutes. I'm gonna talk a bit about software developers. And uh, do we have any software developers in the audience? Okay, that's pretty good, actually. Yeah, well, I, Neo developers don't count. Uh, so, yeah, we've got a huge software development team in Neo. We have 200 software developers. And um, you know, I would say we're a very fast-moving software development team. 
what are the keys to new success and how we've actually gotten like some amazing products going in, in you know, for the banking industry in a really, really short amount of time is because of our, our talented, fast-moving development team. And our development team, you know, um, these are some of their values. They really value freedom and, and autonomy. You know, if, if we tell them, hey, you know, put your data in this database, they'll be like, don't tell me where to put my data, man. Right? They, they want to make those decisions for themselves. And, um, and we organize our teams into, we have like 20 development teams at NEO, really small distributed teams. Each team has ownership over their own area as well. And, and they do get to make a lot of the decisions. So if there's a team that's in charge of credit card processing, they're picking some of the tech to use, they're figuring out the data structure, they're doing all that on their own. And, and they value being you know, hyper agile, being able to change things at the drop of a hat. Oh, I'll just, I don't know, we'll just delete that microservice and build a new one. Um, and, and that kind of thing is happening like on a daily basis at NEO. It's a really, really fast paced team. And we build code using things like uh, cloud-based microservices and even serverless code and cloud functions. Um, we, use, we use NoSQL databases quite a bit. And, and not only NoSQL databases, we use, we use Mongo. Um, and I'm sure some of you guys, who knows about Mongo? I love making people raise their hands. It's like a power trip. Okay, cool. So yeah, you know about MongoDB. It's a schema-less database, right? It's a non-relational database. It's, it's actually, uh, it poses lots of uh, interesting problems. But even in addition to Mongo, we have all kinds of other weird databases that we use. You know, we use Redis. We use, we use something called AWS Quantum Ledger, which is actually like a blockchain-like data store. And that's where all of our financial data sits. So we have all these crazy databases, and developers you know, sometimes they're not really, uh, they're not really asking anyone well, if, if they can use these technologies. You know, we have an AWS account, AWS announces something cool at reInvent, two months later I hear about it, it's in production. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, we drew a little diagram here. We have hundreds of microservices in Neo, and these hundreds of microservices, they follow this something called the shared nothing approach, right? So they, they, they literally, you know, each run on their own, um, you know, cloud-based uh, instance, uh, their own cloud-based container, but they have their own little API, they have their own database, they have their own data storage. Many of them have their own conventions or standards, um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that team even has, you know, their own software development process. So um, not a lot is always shared between these services. So if you imagine up there, you know, a couple of those databases might be MongoDB, and then one of them might be MongoDB with the data schema, and it's really weird. And then one of those databases might be some sort of bizarre Amazon quantum ledger. Why do they use the word quantum? Nobody knows. So basically, if you take this approach, um, this will make your data team hate you. And um, yeah, that's, that, we don't get along. Very much. <laughs> because, you know, we have all these teams moving so quickly, and, and storing data in so many different ways, uh, so many different schemas, so many uh, different paradigms even, and things like uh, schemaless data, that um, it can make data really difficult. And so there's some immediate problems that start coming up with Neo's architecture and our culture of fast moving dev teams. With data spread everywhere, how do we aggregate this data together and join it together um, to actually do complex analysis and, and even run queries. Um, queries that span many of these services, many of these databases, and, and different data sets. Um, and then how do we even find the data we need? And I know a few people have talked about that here um, at the conference. Um, but with, with 200 microservices, which one is producing the data that answers the question that you want to pose? Um, and sometimes it's, the answer is none of them do. You need to combine, combine data sets. Um, and then there's also the problem of, of breakages, right? So if data in all of these services is always changing, um, and then somebody's trying to query it or you know, run analytics or they have a dashboard that they've built, how do we prevent those things from breaking? And governance is really important too, and aspects of government, governance like tracing the lineage of data. Even if we have a, a, a report that we've built or a dashboard that we've built, and someone says, hey, this dashboard looks great. Where did that data come from? And then we're like, oh, I don't know. Like, yeah, like how do we, how do we, how do we answer those kinds of questions, right? So um, there can be a lot of problems to having a highly autonomous, distributed, fast-moving dev team. And so that's where our data team comes in. 
Yeah, and I want to start by saying it's not a, it's not a hatred. No. I don't hate you. No, no we're actually, it's very difficult we're sometimes. Um, but a lot of the difficulty is actually really positive. Um, and Neo are really trying to optimize for many different things at the same time. Uh, I think the flexibility that Chris alluded to uh, that our, our devs have uh, is a really powerful force for moving Neo forward. Uh, at the same time, we have some different quantities we want to optimize for. Quantities that are a little bit less chaotic. Um, they don't love change, right? We don't like to see KPIs reported in different ways with different numbers yeah. all the time. Uh, and it really becomes the data team's job to, you know, to take a look at our entire data landscape and identify ways to, to reduce the noise. And if you've worked in any of my teams before, we talked a lot about entropy. Um, that world is a high entropy world uh, for data people. There's a lot of change, there's a lot of chaos. Um, but our job is really to sit in the middle, to, to look at the chaos and to bring it into order. And that's what this diagram is intended to, to show. Um, so what are some of the things that we value? Um, I think, you know, these values are, are things that we value, but they're not at opposition of the things that Chris talked about for our devs. But we have to have a strong plan in place at all times. Um, I'm going to talk soon about you know, a bow tie that we often talk about within our organization. Um, and really, we sit at the center of the bow tie. And within Neo, we have how many squads? 15? Oh, oh yeah. More health? Sure. A yes. lot of squads, <laughs> a lot of microservices uh, that kind of sit to the left of us. Uh, and they're all producing data. Um, so having a strong plan means really keeping all those stakeholders in the loop with us, understanding what their plans are, what their product roadmap looks like. Uh, and ensuring that we have a plan in place to, to accommodate it all and, and not roadblock them um, by landing it in our, our data platform. We really value a controlled data model at Neo. So all this wacky NoSQL business, I don't like it. Uh, it changes, it's weird, there's keys and values. I like tables, I like schemas, I like well-defined columns. Um, yeah. It's not, it's not just you, you know, we talked about how Neo is growing really fast. It's not just the data team or the development team that's growing really fast, right? We have all these other teams, our marketing team, for example, right? And the marketing team is growing really, really fast and hiring new people and doing amazing things, you know, stickers and TV commercials, and, and they value a controlled data model. They want very much do. Yeah, they want nice, clean, structured, easy to query data, right? Yep. So when family name changes to last name upstream somewhere, they still want to see some of the last name. Um, so we really value having that control and, and maintaining that kind of enforcement of, of schema within our data environment. The third thing that I'm going to talk about, and I'll talk about a lot, and I'll point at Sandra when I do, because she's partially responsible for this. Uh, privacy is not negotiable at Neo. Uh, so we're handling a lot of customer and consumer data, um, and our customers are trusting us with that data. So ensuring that people within the organization only see the data they have access to or should have access to within their role. Um, and really doing that while all this stuff is happening upstream, um, that's a big value, and we put a lot of effort and time into making sure that happens. The final thing that I've called out here is slow and steady wins. Um, things go fast at Neo. Um, it's a very, very high-paced environment. It's very exciting to work in, um, but there has to be, within the data world, you know, some, build, uh, some ability to decouple from that speed. Uh, to slow things down a bit, because if we kind of jump from a problem to a solution in data land, uh, we tend to live with a lot of problems later on that are really hard to fix, take a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, so it's really about you know managing change, keeping things manageable and, and slow so that we can move the ball forward consistently every day, uh, not in fits and starts. So what's our strategy to do this? Um, well, this is it. Thanks, There's six points here. Right? That's it, we're done. Yeah. Uh, you can have to take the slide and go home. Just stream it all into a data link and you're done. <laughs> That's all you need to do and your data will be perfect. And if you listen to your cloud provider, that might be what they tell you to do. Just stream it all into a data lake, it's fine. Um, but that's really just step one for us. Uh, so we, we do use a data lake, sure. Uh, but really our, our initial strategy is to land everything in our data lake you know, at the resolution that it requires and the speed that's required. So most of Neo is actually set up with a real-time collection system. Uh, we collect data usually by event systems, um, through change data capture and similar tools. Uh, and we land it all in one giant S3 bucket. Um, we have some other data that comes in in batches where it's not as important maybe for, for intraday kind of operations. 
Uh, but really our strategy is, if we can get it in real time, we'll get it in real time. And from there, we just say, go at it. We distribute ownership. Cool. Uh, so that means our devs and our business teams you know, have ownership of that data. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about our structure of our teams where we have data uh, folks working within our dev teams and dev teams working within data. Uh, and we have business teams who interact with the data platform, but they do not do so in a chaotic manner. There is order. There are tools and there are solid patterns. Uh, and those are really in place to provide bumper rails for people so they don't go off building some crazy tool. Like I saw at one point in time that it was a Python script machine that spit out data in JSON objects. Uh, that happened once. Uh, it doesn't happen anymore. Now we have great tools, we have a great platform set up, and a really awesome, smart data infrastructure team that maintains those tools and enforces those patterns to make sure people fall in line uh, and don't make more chaos within our data landscape. Uh, and finally, we automate it all. So nothing in Neo lives in, at least in our data teams, nothing really lives out on its own, um, save for ad hoc queries that perhaps someone wants to run. Everything is under version control, which data people don't generally think too much about. Um, everything is managed and automated so that our work is, is versioned, it's, it's automatable, and we're not putting a bunch of time into keeping the root Goldberg machine of data up and running. Finally, that all takes care of people, yeah, uh, like myself. That's really important. Yeah, like it's with, really important to have smart people with hair like this <laughs> uh, to keep it all, all working. Okay, I'm moving on then. I'm moving on before you keep going on about the wig. I'm going to grab some water. So uh, while you have a sip, um, I'll quickly introduce this, and, and Andrew mentioned it. Um, it's a bow, bow tie approach, right? It kind of looks like a bow tie here. And uh, if you look at the diagram on the left, uh, Andrew made this. What he did is he, he took the diagram I had with all these microservices and all these databases, tilted it, right? And that, that's where you start over on the left. And really, the intention here was to show how much more difficult it is to be a data person than a dev. <laughs> yeah, JK. Well, uh, not true. Um, but there is a lot more complexity involved um, that I can show on a slide, actually. That's the reality of it. Um, so I guess, moving from the left to the right, Chris mentioned, yeah, the, the far left-hand side of the screen is, uh, you know, uh, dev land. But when we get to this collector column, uh, that's really where we move into data land. So this is gold, by the way, so you're welcome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> our collection system is, is really set up to target primarily um, our Mongo primary database, or Mongo is our primary data store. Um, so we're usually targeting a change stream there and collecting data and events in real time. Uh, and we put all of that into one massive stream. And I think of the collectors as when I'm hiking, there's little streams coming down the mountains, they're very pretty. Those are collectors. They flow into a river. That's our stream bucket here. Uh, and I'll get into the tools and technologies that support these a little bit later. Uh, and then really our data finds its put itself in one of two places. Either it's going into a streaming application, fraud detection, credit um, adjudication, rewards stuff, um, or it's going into a giant bucket of storage. Um, and really from there, we take all of this raw data. I actually have every event that ever happened at Neo. I can see the very first thing. It's a lot happened. of data. It's pretty cool. I think we're up to uh, four billion events a year. Yeah. And last year we quadrupled that, so that was fun. Uh, and all that lives in storage. So the entire history of our company lives in one S3 bucket, or plus three buckets. Um, and from there, we do various things with the data. So we clean it up, we put data into trusted zones. Um, you know, we have auditing and governance features that are active on those buckets. Uh, you can query it directly using one of our query engines. Uh, and we build a lot of our ML and machine learning pipelines off of that data set. Um, so when all that's said and done, we have this thing. Um, and then really the goal is to use these different tools to, to serve various business needs and needs within our dev teams. Tech. Tech. Um, yeah. I'm going to just punch on these. Um, people are probably curious to know what we actually use at Neo, so I'll, I'll uh, you know, go back the curtain a bit here and, and tell you. Um, so for our pipelines, we, we're actually an open source company almost across the board. We love using open source software. Uh, so we use within our data teams, Kafka and Kafka Connect. Uh, and I'll actually mention here, everything we use, or most things we use, actually has almost like 
two options. So our data infra infra team will use uh, MSK and Fabric Connect in like a self-managed way. Uh, but we also have Confluent for less savvy users. Um, the same thing, but one's a little bit easier to use. Uh, and that's how we handle our pipelining. For our compute engines, um, we really just have one, uh, but two variants of it as well. So we have Spark, and did anyone attend yesterday's event with Pedro Nicotelli? Yeah. Uh, Pedro was one of our data team leads. Is that cool? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll, sh I'll share some love with Pedro for that. I think it was awesome. Um, but yeah, our data infrastructure team relies heavily on Spark and Kubernetes um, for a lot of our batch jobs and streaming jobs. Uh, and we use Databricks as well within our business pretty heavily, uh, different notebook and, and SQL query features there. For modeling, we use dbt. Has anyone used dbt? It's really good. You should check it out. Yeah, if you Google it, something about like diabolical behavioral therapy <laughs> comes up every time. <laughs> it's very concerning, but it's a real thing. It's really cool. Uh, and I'll get into that a bit more later. Uh, governance, Sandra. We use uh, both the combination of dbt uh, and some self-built tooling that we use for handling governance within our machine learning products. For BI and dashboards, we have a tool called Light Dash. Has anyone heard of Light Dash? You're going to see a screenshot. One person heard of Light Dash. You'll yeah. see a screenshot. It is awesome, and it is really easy. So that's fun. Uh, and finally, for ML, we have a framework that we use called NewML, um, which I'll get into later. It just helps us with our ML projects. I think this must have been on everybody's minds when we when I brought up MongoDB, right? And when we were talking about how our business people want to use SQL, but we have like 300 MongoDB databases, right? How can we map all of this NoSQL data that is schemaless? And you know, if you're not familiar with schemaless data, hopefully everyone is. You know, it's like imagine a table, you know, in a relational database, but every row has different columns. <laughs> so that doesn't make any sense, basically. And uh, that, that's how you know schemaless uh, collections can work. Um, every single entry in the collection can have different attributes. Um, and then it's non-relational data, so that means that if you have a foreign key, you know, let's say you have a user and the user has an account, um, there's no enforcement that you know, every user has an account or every account belongs to a user, nothing like that. Yeah, it's, it can be tough. Um, but like I said, our, our job is really to make, to make sense and to make uh, you know, that smooth little diagram from the chaos. Um, so, kind of just move this pretty quickly. Uh, what we tend to do is we actually capture every event in real time, and we move it to a giant bucket, which I already alluded to, that has the history of Neo, like one big storybook. Uh, and then we, we use fast batches uh, to handle our data warehouse. So every 30 minutes, 15 minutes, hour, based on the use case for the data, jobs are running, they're crushing that data into structured tables, and they're schema auto-merging at the same time. Yeah, what, is schema, really what is schema auto-merge? So my example with family name and last name, that didn't happen by the way, but I'm, I'm making that up. Um, when you change family name to last name in your Mongo collections, uh, we actually update that field's name. Automatically. Automatically, right. which everyone would ask, oh my, oh no, what's gonna happen to all the stuff that we built on this data? And you should be asking that question because before, things would go bad. Uh, it was a lot of work. Any late nights? And I think the cool thing is that you know these are, these are solved problems, and uh, I don't think very many companies have, have solved them. And a lot of times the solution is, you know, again, like tell your developers to put their data in SQL because uh, maybe no solution is apparent. Yeah. Well, to finish that thought, we actually have built on some lineage uh, oh, yeah. to help you know, measure the effect of that change and not break stuff. Yep. So. It's been good, and it works really well. Sandra, thank you. Okay, um, so I'm gonna walk through some of the initial things we talked about that we do at NEO, um, and I'm gonna touch on how we use the technology um, to solve the problem in each specific space. Um, so for reporting, when you wanna generate a report at NEO, um, it's pretty easy. You, if you know what dbt is, and you've used it before, you go into dbt, uh, there's a project for that, specifically for dbt within our company. Uh, you can write your report in SQL, uh, you can set up your test cases, because every data developer should develop test cases for their data sets. Just saying. Uh, you can develop your test cases, you can use macros, which 
are really cool in dbt. Uh, if anyone's using like, a cloud-based data warehouse, uh, you're probably like lamenting the loss of stored procedures and functions and all these weird things you had to set up to do that. dbt helps you with that. Um, but you can write your report um, in such a way that it's up and ready and available as a dbt model. Uh, and we have a really smart team that put together an integration job, which is like the Swiss Army knife of integration. And you just run a command line uh, with dbt, and the report is generated, and it's living in a SFTP server somewhere for a financial partner. I don't know how many reports we have. I doubt well, dozens. Probably, probably not 100, maybe almost those. 60. Yeah, 60, 60 reports. And these are huge reports. We're talking about you know, maybe a, a report at the end of the month that has every single transaction executed by every single customer at NEO. We have over a million open accounts. They could be, again, yeah, like uh, billions of rows in these reports. And they deal with encryption and all kinds of other problems um, yeah. to generate these report sets. Yeah, it's a lot of it's a lot of reporting, it's a lot of data. And there's a lot of focus on quality there. So we find using DBT as a tool really helps us ensure uh, those test cases work and our, our data quality is top notch. Um, the second thing I'll cover is monitoring. So we use our data platform extensively for monitoring because it's got all the data. Uh, if you're working as a dev, what do you do when you want to troubleshoot an issue that crosses multiple services? Yeah, exactly. Somebody will usually say, who knows how to use uh, Databricks? And then one person on the dev team will be like me. And then we'll look at Databricks. Yeah, we'll, we'll do some ad hoc queries of all this data. Um, because troubleshooting problems across 300 microservices can be really tough. You know, uh, you might have a problem in one service, it cascades down, cause problems in, in five services, 10 services, 50 services, and, and having all the data in one place is really going to help. Yeah, so that's one of the bullets I wanted to highlight here. Um, it's a really effective tool just internally for helping us troubleshoot and find those issues uh, because it has access to all the data. But we also use a lot of streaming applications um, and alerting using the data platform to inform various things within our business. Uh, it could be a business thing like, hey, this transaction looks kind of weird. You might want to look at it. Uh, it could also be you know, a developer focused thing where maybe the service is getting hit really hard. You might want to see what's going on with that. It seems like someone sent a text blast and everyone's responding to it. Um, business intelligence. It's an, it's an oxymoron. <laughs> sorry? I'm sorry, I had to say it's an oxymoron. Well, I know data yeah. people hate that joke, though. No, it's true, though. There's no business people here, right? We're all data people, exclusively data people. So, um, K-I-S-S, -S, great advice, hurts my feelings every time. Does anyone know the reference? Keep it simple. No, it's because we both look like we're in the band, Kiss. <laughs> it's from the office, actually. Dwight says it, but um, um, so we don't like to waste time making fancy graphs and charts. We've all seen where that goes. A million Power BI dashboards that are passed around by email. It doesn't happen at Neo. We use a tool called LightDash. It requires virtually zero effort to maintain. You just log in, and your data is there, and it's connected to our DBT uh, project with all that documentation. So if you want to know what a field looks like, just hover over it. It's super easy. I recommend everyone go out and take a look if you're using DBT. It's a really cool tool. Yeah, and it's, I think it's free, so or like free. very cheap. So yeah, this is what Light Dash looks like, but this isn't Neo Data. We actually originally had a screenshot of Neo Data, and then we were like, no nope, privacy concerns. Uh, can't show uh, that stuff outside the company. But um, this is a pretty cool screenshot. So we violate one of our values. So we're not going to do that. But this is the kind of interface a lot of uh, business units would have, and and they can do their own. Uh, to query, set up their own dashboards, have their own graphs, uh, charts, and things like that. And just a final plug for this, if you're familiar with Looker, if you used Looker in the past, this tool is actually being built by ex-Looker devs, so it has a very similar looking feel without the LookML, which you will appreciate if you've used it. Um, moving on, decisioning. Um, this is kind of a cool space, um, but really, uh, you know, the point of this slide is to, to talk about the ways that we handle the various questions that we get and when real-time decisions need to be made. And there's a lot of these. I listed three because it's easier just to talk about the same things, but um, you know, is this transaction fraudulent? What are the chances that a potential customer is going to default on this loan if I offer it to them? And what's an appropriate credit limit for this customer's credit card? Um, so within Neo, we've developed a framework called NeoML. Uh, that actually allows us to, to build and train models that answer these questions, um, but allows us to do it using 
we call like dual use configurations. Essentially, we we can pass a config file to that project's uh, structure, and we can use a batch data set for model training, and that enters into our, our ML pipelines. Uh, and we can also use the same config file to run a stream. What that allows us to do is actually short circuit the whole process of devs. Uh, we get to train a model, deploy it, and we can launch an application in tandem with that uh, to test it out. Maybe send a Slack message or uh, enter a row into a spreadsheet for someone to look like. It's a really fast way for us to test out these decisioning tools really quickly and to get feedback from our business partners. And finally, did, oh, go ahead. I was going to say this is the last one. Yeah, it's a lot. I'm parched. Uh, data science, um, which I already kind of alluded to, uh, NeoML is our platform of choice. It's built by a bunch of really smart people. I said nerds on the slide, so none of them are here, so it's fine. Mm -hmm. Oh no. Um, really smart people who have packaged a lot of our models uh, and ensured that all of our models that we build at Neo, um, whether they're stats models or machine learning models or what have you, they're all really, really scalable. So they all run natively on uh, you know, distributed computing platforms like Spark, uh, and they're, they're managed by this team and made available to everyone within Neo. Um, we serve a lot of our models, models sorry, versus, oh, I got confused. Uh, we serve a lot of them via MLflow, uh, and we handle release management through MLflow, uh, and it's all set up with automation in mind, like I mentioned. Um, automation is key, so you push your project in and bam, a service exists that our devs can hit and you can get a score back to answer any one of those questions from before. And this is something we're really working on at Neo, and it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, it, it's trying to have the, some of the same sort of fast moving and like uh, development practices that our dev teams have perfected out, emphasis on automated testing, continuous delivery, um, build pipelines, trying to make sure we're rigorously setting those things up uh, more and more in our data space. Good to go on now? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> I think okay. this is for you. Yeah. yeah, so these are some of the questions and problems I had on the screen earlier. So what I hope to kind of do here as we, as we get near the end of the presentation um, is show you guys that um, we've overcome some of these problems generated by the party in the back. Uh, so, so Andrew, uh, is it possible to find join and query data that's generated from all these fast moving dev teams. Absolutely. Um, so we can find our data. We have really good data governance tools in place that help us document and maintain all our documentation and lineage of our data. So I can find it there. I can go into my SQL engine of choice, actually, and join and query the data. And what about breaking things? If one of those developers in the back row puts in a commit and changes the names of a bunch of, of fields and moves data around, is it just Business is over, everybody goes home? No. no usually no. <laughs> no, but I will say we're not, uh, we're not building to prevent all breakages. Uh, we really focus our efforts on the things that really matter. Um, so if your thing matters, you can build a test case and you can hook it into our platform. And we'll make sure we let you know before someone pushes through a change that breaks your thing. Um, but if it doesn't matter or if you don't, you know, you're not going to come back to it until a few months from now uh, and it's not that important, it might break, um, but it's really about finding a flexible approach that kind of meets the needs of our devs while ensuring reasonable uh, you know, level of, of availability of our data. Yeah, and then what about governance, privacy, and compliance in an environment like this with, with 20 dev teams churning out MongoDB data? Yes. Yes. And no, we are. Uh, <laughs> that was, that's right. <laughs> um, and what about scalability? <laughs> we have to go back to that. It's okay. important. Um, governance, privacy, and compliance are, are critical to everything we do. Yeah. And so when we built our platform, we built it with governance baked in. Right, Sandra? Yes, she's nodding. She's a little bit embarrassed, probably. Um, yeah, the governance. What's that? Yeah. My wife told me I look like my mom when I put this on, which was really hard to hear. Um, no, governance. <laughs> That's a complete segue. Uh, governance, <laughs> privacy, and compliance are baked into everything we do within our platform. Uh, and we set everything up really to ensure that those are held true, no matter what our devs are doing. Uh, the work that we do within our data platform is, is kind of meeting those standards that we've set. Okay. And uh, 
this is kind of wrapping up the talk, and we'll have some time for questions, but um, there are still some challenges you know, at our company, and even though we've married this, uh, or we've made this bow tie happen between this very fast-moving, hyper-agile, modern, ad adopt cutting-edge technology dev side, and the stable, has to work for the entire business, has to be reliable data side, we, we do still have some problems. What are some of the top of mind problems that you're working on this month? Honestly, like one of the biggest problems we deal with is, is finding and retaining really good people. Um, so like good talent is really hard to find, uh, which is why events like this are so important in Calgary. Um, and I've seen over the past few years, like the Calgary data um, environment has has really improved. A lot of folks have gotten excited. And I think the number of people at this event is just a testament to um, the smart people who want to do this kind of work. Uh, but that's a real challenge, and it continues to be a focus for us. Yeah, we hiring great people. A lot of, we do bring in a lot of people, and we are still growing, we are still hiring. Um, and then we've got to train them. And that's, that's actually pretty tough, too, because we do a lot, we're trying to do a lot of cross training. We're trying to you know, build a company where developers who are working on, let's say, a mobile app can use Databricks. To, as part of their jobs. And that means that the tech stack is not just you know, building a website, it's not just building an app, it's not even just building a backend service, but um, it spans all the tech you guys saw today. Um, and, and vice versa, we want folks on the, on the data side who are, who are spending more of their time working with tools like DBT or, or ML to also have the ability to, to jump in and help us with uh, maybe uh, writing some backend code or, or like write the decryption code that, that decrypts the thing that some other developer encrypted, right? So that cross-training is really tough. It takes a lot of work. Yeah, that was a real example. One of our data devs got to jump in and do that. Yeah, we did, do, we did have that happen, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Pedro, have you met Pedro? Uh, yeah, I already asked. Um, yeah, I think another, like, I'll just, one last comment here. I think another challenge that we see is just the number of problems that we have to solve. There are too many of them, and they're all exciting, but there's a lot of them. So I think using this technology, using these tools and the teams that we've built, um, and applying them to some really hard problems, that's the next few years for us, because uh, we have a lot of problems to solve. Yeah, and, and you know, if you know about Neo, you know we've grown really, really fast. Most companies take longer, and they have more time. And so um, growing really fast means that we we're always behind, and yeah, we you know even if we hire, 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 and bring in 20 new people, by the time those 20 new people are ramped up and working on problems, we probably have 100 new problems, right? From the number of customers we have, the number of new products we're launching, the exciting new features we want to build, and all those kinds of things. So keeping up is is uh, is tough, but fun. Very fun, because these are great problems to solve. Uh, who else gets to to build a bank? Yeah. Okay. Any questions? We got 15 minutes, and you can ask about the, the hair if you want to. We had one back there. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I actually have uh, two questions. So the first one is, uh, I know that the the tag is changed a lot um, in the company. So how did you decide which tag you're gonna use, like uh, for some? Like scalability problem, and you have to change to another tag. Uh, how, what type of step you are doing for this? And the second question is that, do you have any like uh, testing platform that should test the new technology that if it's feasible or not? So just to repeat the two questions, one was how do we pick the tech or solve problems when the it was scale and having to maybe change out the tech? And the second question was about testing. Uh, do you want to take one? Yeah, I'll take the I'll take the first one, uh, and I'll, I'll focus on our data environment. Um, really, two things are very important to us at the outset. I think the first you alluded to scalability. Um, I think last year we would have processed around four billion. I mentioned already four billion events last year. Uh, we're knocking that out of the park this year. Uh, so we need systems that scale nearly infinitely, or at least to the ability that our cloud provider can scale. Um, so that was one of our primary considerations, and everything you see on this list scales. There's no bottleneck in a process right now yet that I'm aware of. Well, I'm sure one will come out soon. Um, yeah, and the, the second thing is really high performance. Um, so we're in an industry where we have some requirements that are time bound. Um, so we needed a data platform that could provide a response on a transaction in milliseconds, not in a few minutes. 
Uh, so building uh, the platform, we really took those requirements into mind, and that's the things we focused on. Something I'll maybe add to that sort of tech choices question. When we were running through the tech, you saw things like Light, Light Dash, for example. And um, as the name would suggest, it's a lightweight tool. And what we kind of found is having a, a lot of lightweight tools is very flexible. And if we do need to change out uh, some part of our tech stack, um, we can because we just have a bunch of lightweight tools. And a lot of them are free. So uh, there's not a lot of friction to making those sorts of things happen. Um, we also try and choose things that are popular, things like Kafka that, that are proven out, right? Um, and uh, there's no real magic to it, though. I think the smart people thing comes into play. We hire a lot of really smart people at Neo, um, and many of them are in the room, and they make good choices. And they've, they've done this sort of thing before. You know, they've maybe worked at big tech companies before, and we're trying to see a year or two out, where are we going to be, and make sure we build things to that standard. Uh, I don't think there's any placement for smart people. Um, what about, what about testing? testing? Yeah. You go. I would say, okay, that's, that's a tough question because I think there's a lot of different testing tech we have. We don't have like sort of like a single, you know, testing tool or testing framework. Um, we write a lot of unit tests in Neo, probably more than anywhere. <laughs> like in the, in the city, probably. Uh, maybe not in the world, but in the city. Um, and we write unit tests for everything from, hey, we have some serverless cloud function, a Lambda function, or something like that. Let's make sure it's unit tested. Okay, we have some Python script. Can we write unit tests for that? Hey, we're generating a report. Okay, can we have unit tests for that? And it's definitely not the only type of testing we have. We have other types of testing, automated validations. We have chaos engine-y things that are almost like chaos engine. Probably not as chaotic, though. Um, but yeah, we have all kinds of testing strategies across, across Neo. Probably too many to mention. But I think a heavy, heavy, heavy emphasis on unit testing. Um, and you know, when we're building a lot of, again, small, lightweight things, um, that's a great strategy to actually have. So I have a question uh, related to, to testing in, in terms of CICD. Do you understand correctly that the data team has actually created integration tests where a software engineer making a change, if it breaks a data model in a schema-less data world, uh, that would actually fail a, a pull request merge? <laughs> we, yeah, we do have some tech like that. And, it, and like Andrew said, I don't want to get the wrong impression that like every single field and every single database in Neo is tooled that way. But um, yeah, we've got uh, sort of patterns and tech in place so that when we identify data that we want to be kind of stable or you know, that's mission critical or that can't change or would cause problems, we can create uh, tests to actually validate change or tooling to at least monitor, hey, something's changed here and it probably shouldn't have, and then you know, block a pipeline uh, or block a deployment um, and even send a notification, right, so that we can address that kind of stuff proactively. We tie it back to criticality. So um, there are some things that are good to know, like here's the owner of the thing that you're going to break. Uh, and there are some things like, you may not break this thing, you may not proceed with this peer. So we try to delineate it so we're not stopping everything, we're stopping the things that, that really matter for our business. In practice, it's a really collaborative culture, so what would really happen is probably like, like just literally like walking over to Andrew's desk or walking to somebody's you know, desk, which is like a Neo few feet away, and, and just being like, hey, I gotta get this thing deployed, what do we need to do to not break the things that we set up a learning on, or, or you know, how do I unblock my pipeline? We just get a lot of help from other people uh, at the company. Awesome, yep. and it sounds like uh, Neo's gone quite far into the world of maybe CI/CD for things like the ML deployment pipelines. Love that. Um, sounds like ahead of industry on that. Uh, where can I learn more about what Neo is doing? You can join. <laughs> Go to www.neofinancial.com/careers. Sweet. What's we'll up? Um, I mean, feel free to find me after this chat as well. I'm happy to That's detail way. more with you. Um, hi. I actually just built on what he mentioned about ML ops. I'm a bit curious on how that journey started, what hiccups you faced, uh, how did you end up choosing the tools that you did choose, and so on. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so within our Within Neo, it actually started within our fraud space. Um, so last year, 
last year, I think in the summer, yeah, yeah. last year in the summer, we were um, actually, I think, you know, having some issues with some fraudsters who were trying to take some money from us. Um, so we started to dig in and we had built a couple of models, um, but they were very rudimentary. Um, they were really good. I have statisticians and mathematicians on my team, so they all know the numbers. But when it came to the deployment, it wasn't great. Um, so we took a look at that and we tried to figure out what can we do to get this you know, tied back in to our, our upstream system, to our actual application. Um, and we iterated. We tried, I want to say we tried between five and ten things um, before we really landed on an approach that worked. Um, and yeah, it was, it's not easy. I mean, the ML space is really messy and convoluted, especially when you get to ML ops, you get into deployment, into integration options, like something simple, like an XGBoost model, yay. Um, why are there so many ways to deploy that? Uh, and like, if you're using Scala, because you have some streaming stuff you need to do Scala for, there's not very good Scala options. So it becomes this whole mess of like, how do we build something that can consistently get an endpoint out and a model bundle available for someone with an ML flow while remaining within our existing architecture? Um, that was a whole, whole bunch of iteration. Yeah, I don't know how to cover that in, in one minute. So. I think you covered it forever. I, I think yeah. we iterate on a lot of things, like we're figuring it out as we go. And it's, it's not just like ML, it's like, have you ever built a bank before? No. Me either, as it turns out. And, but we, you know, we, we know where we want to be. We know what we want to do. We know what kind of company we want to have. And so we just keep trying and trying and trying. Definitely sometimes some sleepless nights or, oh my God, we got to do this over again for like the third time. But um, we end up in a good place. And um, I think some companies are afraid to try. They're afraid to pick a tech. It takes them a year to pick a tech, or they just say, oh, we're gonna have to hire a consulting company or something to come in because you know, they're maybe afraid to, to iterate. Yeah, and like, to close off that thought, um, there were no good like, off-the-shelf solutions in that space. So I would say to folks, if you're having an issue getting your ML products deployed, don't be afraid to go off script and build something that works for you. Uh, it worked out really well for us. Um, and as long as you take an iterative approach and you're constantly working towards the right outcomes, um, ultimately you'll, you'll probably be successful. It just takes a bit of time and effort. Are you planning on open sourcing that? Mm, TBD. <laughs> <laughs> maybe though, maybe though. Maybe. We have open source some things in you, but I won't, that's a distracting, distracting topic. Question up front. Hey. Great office joke. Thank you. No one laughed, so I did. I did. I did. I did but very close. Um, so you talk a lot about growth, and we also talk, of, and I also heard a lot about being kind of resource constrained. And so as Neo continues to grow, you've obviously made some acquisitions of like HSBC and their kind of rewards program. So how does the data team prioritize the ingestion of kind of new things that are coming in against all of the work that you have internally? Just to clarify for the audience too, we did not acquire HSBC. Okay. But uh, HB, we, we do run a, a credit card and rewards program for HBC. Yes. Which is that's a, what I mean. That's his bank. Yeah. Um, HSBC is another bank, and they sold to like RBC. We will. We will. Yeah, we'll, we'll acquire them all eventually. All eventually. Um, that's a good question. So the question, you know, to get back to it was, how do we prioritize ingestion of like maybe a ton of new data for a project? against all the other you know, priorities? That's uh, automation. That question, right? So I think it, like we had an earlier slide that talked about good systems, smart people, automation, um, process. Um, so yeah, we, we often take a look at you know, that entire body of work. Integration is a great one. Uh, and we look at all the commonalities, and we build tools that really cater to the commonalities, not to specific instances of an integration. Um, so Pedro and team, have you met Pedro? Um, they have a ton of integrations uh, that they manage by a very small tool chain. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's actually quite a, quite a wonder. So when we come into a new partnership or we have a new data that so we need to integrate, um, there's not much we haven't seen now. It's a sort of weird proprietary formats that banks love to use. Like, yeah, some of those are weird and that takes a bit of time. But I would say we don't spend the, nearly the amount of time we used to spend in this area. A lot of it's prepackaged work that just gets you know another instance to handle this new data set. I was going to say the same thing. Like I, I think 
a huge secret to success there is we dealt with so many kinds of data in so many formats in the past, let's say the first two years of the business. And you know, because we weren't afraid to just say, okay, we need to deal with CSV data now, oh no, XML data, oh no, Mongo data, JSON data, BSON data, encrypted data, and all these different types of data. Um, at some point, I think you start to build reuse into it, right? And you start to have different layers of technology that are kind of structured out where if you need to add you know, the functionality to say, do some giant import or something like that, you know exactly which layers need improvements. It's sort of all kind of you know, modular and, and again, fairly lightweight, and you can do that kind of thing really quickly. But I actually think you know, your question doesn't really have an answer. Prioritization is super hard. And we're, like, to Andrew's point earlier, we, one of the biggest challenges at NEO is that we have way more problems to solve and way more things we want to build. Um, if you've used our, our app, by the way, how many people have signed up during this talk? Oh, somebody did. If you've used our app, you might be even finding features that are missing. And we don't pretend that we have the world of Canadian finances solved yet, right? We're, we're a new player in the market, and so that's a constant challenge, just arguing about what's our next priority, what's the next thing we're going to improve, what's the next thing we're going to build. Um, but by being really fast and solving these kinds of data problems, you know, we hope to leapfrog some of our competition, and uh, I think we, we maybe are. Yeah, time will tell. It gets back to like going from chaos to order. Um, if we have orderly systems and processes and tools and all of these things in our high-level strategy, we can throw people in the mix and we can execute really well. If we don't have those things and we throw people in the mix, uh, things don't look good. Um, so really, this strategy is just a part of how we as NEO up that to continue to grow our business. Yeah, right in the middle there. You might have to yell. We might have to, we have three minutes before. Last the question. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for the great presentation, and you're here as well. That looked good. So as you say that you have almost 300 services running using MongoDB. So I was curious whether you have um, data duplication problem. And if you have that, how do you decide this source of truth? Yeah, so you said what type of problem? Data? Data duplication. So duplication. Same data in it's months. Good question. We actually duplicate a lot of data on purpose. I, I think of it more as an opportunity <laughs> or a solution sometimes than a problem. Um, yeah, we, we make heavy use of, of replicating data. You know, so when we have, say, hundreds of microservices and a, a service needs to know something, instead of kind of asking another service for that information, often we'll have replicated the data that service needs into its own data store, right? So email addresses is something that a lot of services use, and so there's probably 10, 20 services that have email addresses in their databases. So there is that uh, duplication, and then when we stream all of that data into the sort of raw landing zone in our data lake, we probably have email addresses tons of times. But our enterprise data model has one email address. Consistent. Uh, and has a clear owner and a clear source identified in our documentation. Right, Sandra? Documentation. Correct. It don't know. Yeah. So the source of truth does get mapped from that, that strong core model back, and, and there is like going to be one, say, dev team and, and one service that will be identified as, the, as the, the overall owner, even if that data is getting replicated you know, in different places. And it's usually whoever owns ingestion kind of owns the data. That, you know, if, if, if you're taking it in, then it's your problem. And you, you have to be the source of truth. Thanks. I said last question. Oh, no, we don't have any more time for questions. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to wrap up. And if you have questions, I'm going to take off this wig, and I'm going to stand up there in the hallway. And you can come get me later and ask. Or Andrew. Party in the back. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Business in the front, party in the back. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good Saturday.